with you, Rose, and today we're going to be talking about a critique of transcendental meniology by Chad A. Haig on changing the world and our worldviews by changing how we power it. Um, there's a few books that you encounter that once you encounter them, you realize that you weren't really that educated before you encountered them. Uh, some books entail ideas that after you learn those ideas, it's hard to imagine and remember what it was like to think without those ideas. Um, I think Mr. Hack's book is, is an example of that. It's a very powerful concept of how the energy that we use as a society functions as a kind of system of guardrails or a system of directions on how we think that the energy we use to power our world directly shapes um, the orientation of our worldview. Now, this isn't to say that our energy use directly forces or uh, strong arms our worldviews, but it's, it's more like you have kind of cows in a field, right? It's not that the cows can't go anywhere, but they're also stuck between the fences. They have free range, but they don't have freedom. Now, we have to be careful to assume that there's ever such thing as a thought of which isn't somewhat influenced by the world or shaped by the world. We have sociologists like Hunter and Reef and Berger and, and different people who really make strong cases for how the way we think and the societies we live in are strongly uh, connected. Um, to reference the work on Plato we've been doing, um, we've been discussing forms like orbits that planets follow, or you could say guardrails that are via, you know, a car's driving down a road between guardrails. Sir, it can kind of move around on the road, but it's stuck between the guardrails. Um, it, it, it has a course that it has to follow. And what's fascinating is to think of energy or the way that a society uses energy, rather it's agricultural or fossil fuels, that has an impact on its thinking. Um, and a, a way to put it, if you're an agricultural society, you think more in terms of um, cyclic cycles, uh, repetition, the seasons that come and go. There are different seasons, but the same seasons come and go. Uh, whereas under fossil fuels, it's easier to think in terms of infinite progress, infinite change, and you don't have the same cycles. Um, no one directly forces you to think that way, but the very use of energy in X way versus Y way kind of functions in the background to make our thoughts um, go in a certain way that they otherwise would not go in. They're the thoughtless givens, the kind of axioms, the things we don't rationalize about, but that make reasoning possible or that base our reason reasoning, which makes it very difficult to detect them, um, very difficult to even realize that they're present. Uh, but Mr. Hag has managed to uh, see, uh, to keep visible, to keep seeing something that has become invisible to most of us. Uh, to refer to a lot of what we're describing here, Mr. Hag is he's going to emphasize memes as general shapes that structure human thought below the surface rather than just Im images with superimposed text. You know, a lot of times when we think about memes now, we think about these images, these kind of witty images, but Mr. Hag's going to be talking about memes as the background uh, of thought, these things that structure our thinking that are below or pre-thought. Um, in the work that we've done on Benjamin Frondane, say, in the, from the reading group on Existential Monday with Davoud and John, uh, we talk about the difference between rational and non-rational. Uh, where, and also in the Truism, the Rational Trilogy, I'm going to talk about how what we think is rational is relative to what we think is true. If we think it's going to rain today, it becomes rational to bring an umbrella, even if it doesn't rain, uh, which would suggest that what is rational is relative to what we believe is true. Um, truth falls in the category of non-rational because you have to assent to it before you reason. It's actually what makes rationality possible, which is very strange then, because how do we decide our non-rationalities if it must come before rationality? Um, to make rationality possible. Well, this is, this is a very elaborate conversation. But we can think of memes, and Mr. Hag's going to talk about deep memes, as non-rational, as things that structure rationality. And his big point is that energy functions to create... The way a society uses energy generates non-rational memes that structures our rationality in ways we don't realize. You know, it's funny to think Mr. Fondane thought that a society that only had rationality or what David Hume called, um, can, we can think of as autonomous rationality, um, would lead to totalitarianism and oppression because we'd be trapped in that rationality that we needed non-rationality to escape. Well, it would seem that there's something similar going on in Mr. Hag's work where... 
our rationality is structured by our energy use. And the only end, you know, if that energy use becomes uh, parasitic or problematic or is leading to an environmental crisis, well, the only way to escape that can't be according to rationality because that rationality is captured almost delusion by the underlying memes, the, the underlying structures, the underlying non-rationalities. Uh, in order to escape uh, that capture in the um, deconstructive direction we might be heading in, we would need to think non-rational, non-rationally on the realm, on the level of meme, we'd have to combat that. Uh, I just, uh, Daniel Frege's ontological design, and I think the two books overlap really, really well. You know, Mr. Frege will talk about how once you use the technology of a sofa, it conditions your idea of rest. So then when you think about, oh, I need to rest, you think about sitting in a sofa and how the act of using a so sofa uh, become kind of exists in the background of the word rest. So the moment you use rest, it points to the sofa. And that way, technology sort of shapes you. And Mr. Frege's book, Ontological Design, is excellent. Um, and I highly suggest it. Um, similarly, it, Mr. Mr. Hank describes how fossil fuels make possible an economic system and corresponding psychology, psychology which values infinite progress. Um, so when you think about progress or being productive in the same way that you, uh, the word rest makes you think of a sofa, now we think about being productive and think about, um, say, um, participating in the economy, participating in the use of energy as the system has it. Um, I think Mr. Hag makes an incredible point when he says that completion carries the negative connotation of finitude, which is to say that modern progress obsessed thinking is anti-completion. I thought this was really good. I mean, it, if, it, if, the, if the deep meaning of fossil fuels makes us think about infinite progress and always growing and always consuming and growing the economy, then we can't finish anything. And, and so no wonder we have a meaning crisis as Verveke talks about. No wonder we have all the mental health problems that we have. We're like Kafka's K in the novel The Castle and we can never reach it. We're set to fail from the very um, from the very start. Um, but you know, Mr. Hag also is is excellent in that he warns us that stopping fossil fuels or not using them is not easy uh, because the the depletion of fossil fuels would result in the loss of the epistemological structure of the deep meme and all of the truths it allowed to exist. He says it well when he says the loss of oil will literally transform truth into falsehood right before our astonished eyes. I really um, appreciate this because I think sometimes when we think about alternative energies, leaving oil, peak oil, all these different things, we just think about it as a technological problem. But Mr. Hag but for Mr. Hag, it's an entirely it's a psychological, philosophical worldview problem. We have to we have to transform the very non-rational paradigms by which we think about the world and define rational and productive and all of these different things. This is not an easy task. It's not simply a matter of inventing a new technology. Yes, that's part of it, but we also have to existentially stabilize ourselves and be existentially prepared for having the truth turn to fal falsehood right before our very eyes, as Mr. Hag puts it. I, I was particularly impressed. One part of Mr. Hague's work that I was very, very impressed by was his critique of Marx, which I, it, very powerful and innovative. Um, so what Hague said, so what Marx neglects to mention, Hague tells us, is that the industrial model of production, no matter how one chooses to pursue it, is simply impossible in the absence of crucial non-renewable resources such as coal, oil, and natural gas. Resources that are already starting to fall into irreversible decline. The presence or absence of a crucial resource is not not an activity a human subject can tinker to fit a desired outcome, such as the shift to communism. I, I found this to be an excellent um, take on Marx. Um, it, Marx is going to talk so much about the means of production, overturning the means of production, the revolution against the bourgeoisie, so on and so forth. Um, but what Mr. Hag makes us realize um, is that communism doesn't offer a deep alternative to the current socioeconomic order. Um, he, you know, and it made me think also how the Frankfurt School attempted kind of to explain why the inevitable communist revolution never occurred in terms never occurred in terms of capital ideology and psychoanalysis, but perhaps they would have made more progress to discuss energy ideology. Uh, hard, hard to say. Um, but, the, but the point is that you can change the uh, means of production, who owns a mean, means of production all you want, but if the energy sources, if the, what the energy that's used is not changed, then the system will not essentially change, only accidentally change. So you're not going to get real change there. Um, this also made me think of Lakov um, Smil, I can never say his name. Um, he's really excellent on energy and economics, and he basically argues that GDP 
um, in energy use correlates incredibly strongly together. They strongly correlate. Um, you almost want to replace GDP with something I want to call like GEU gross energy use or something. Um, and, and if this is the case, we can really start to th see how um, production, progress, and ideology are practically indivisible. You could talk about the PPI almost, um, which is to say how we produce um, and how we think of progress and thus the ideologies we form um, are always shaped um, according to to energy use uh, in the energies that we use, that the PPI is always a reflection of energy. You know, if we don't change how we produce in terms of energy, uh, well, then ideology is not going to change. Our way of thinking about progress is not going to change. And so we're going to still operate according to an underlying structure of which leads to infinite progress of which could um, ultimately devour the planet if we're not careful. And, you know, if Hag is right that the loss of oil will literally transform truth, his point proves ideology follows energy versus energy um, use follow ideology. I think this is a very powerful idea. Dr. Hag is suggesting that ideology is shaped by energy. So really it's energy, ideology, then means of production. <laughs> so you have another layer there, level there, that comes before ideas that is not um, that is not usually taken into consideration. Um, you know, you can it's you can say it's an intellectual evolution to to move from means of production to ideology. But now there's a third step that needs to be taken, which would be to take energy seriously. And I think that for me really suggests that a very large percent of the socioeconomic order is a reflection of a dialectic between energy and ideas. And that's what I hope to um, put Mr. Smeal, Dr. Smeal, and uh, Dietrich McClowski, um together to discuss uh, because I think I think uh, that's that is the case, and I think Mr. Hag offers good evidence of that. Um, and and so again, it's just very important to understand that the deep meme is a general shape of consciousness influenced by the hard limit of the ultimate energy source of an error. Again, it's like guardrails uh, that a car is driving down the road and is operating between, um, and, and it shapes our thinking in ways that we don't realize. Um, does this mean oil is bad? Well, I mean, that depends. If we're going to start thinking according to oil and thus find ourselves, if, if we're unable to stop thinking according to oil and thus find ourselves unable to stop using it, even when it destroys the environment, then yes, oil will prove bad. Um, but I mean, that said, history is contingent. We can't simply say things today are better or worse than the past. All of that depends on us and what we do now. However, if indeed oil structures the background of our thinking, um, I, th I, th I think the challenge is much much more difficult than we realize. Uh, I think we often just go, well, all we need is uh, you know the right technology, the right alternative energy, and we'll be free. But what Mr. Hag um, describes means there's also an existential level, a psychological level to this change that is going to be very, very difficult. Um, you know, a few more things. I, I loved what Mr. Hag said about Aristotelian metaphysics. Um, I think that's so important. I, I'm so glad he agrees that Derrida doesn't deconstruct Aristotle. Um, I think I think it's a big mistake. Um, and I really appreciated what he had to say, to say on that. Um, and yeah, I, I, I just think that what he's written here is some of the most original and important philosophy of the new millennium. I mean, it's a, it's a work I hope everyone takes to heart. Um, oil won't always be here, and we ignore what that will mean for us economically and psychologically at our own peril. Um, and to close, I just wanted to, to read some of Mr. Hag's works, his own words here. Um, the abrupt onset of a new deep meaning will bring into existence a whole range of new systems, new myths, new values, and perhaps even new non-electric shallow means. At any rate, the transformation of a deep meaning will literally change how one understands the whole world by, in a very real sense, bringing about a whole new world. For more by Mr. Hag, please go to his Amazon page, his YouTube channel, Chad A. Hag, um, and thank you so much for your time.